Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today on Seizing Life, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Alice Lamb to the podcast. Dr. Lamb is a neurologist and principal investigator at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, where her lab explores the interface between epilepsy, neurodegenerative diseases, and cognition. She is here today to discuss the potential impacts that epilepsy can have on cognition and memory. Dr. Lamb, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to have this conversation because I don't know that I have come across anyone who has been touched by epilepsy in one way or another that is not had questions about the impacts on the brain and and memory. Um, So I I think this is going to be a great conversation. I want to start off, though, by just a sort of um, establishing a groundwork for what is... um, what is happening in the brain when a seizure occurs? Great question, Kelly, and thanks um, for inviting me to the podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, all right, so let's start with seizures. Uh, the way I explain seizures to patients is think of them like an electrical storm happening in the brain. And the electrical storm can be happening in one small place in the brain, and it may just stay in that small place, or it could be happening all over the brain all at once. Um, And the symptoms that people have during seizures are related to where that storm is taking place in the brain. Um, And so those symptoms can certainly affect cognition, which we'll talk about later, I'm sure. Um, But even after the storm is done, there's something that we call a post-ictal state. And think about that as sort of the aftermath of the storm, sort of the wreckage that the storm caused. And that can also be associated with symptoms and certainly with cognitive symptoms as well. Okay, so now that we know what is happening in the brain when a seizure occurs, can you talk to us about the short-term impact of seizures on the brain? So you mentioned it sort of depends on where in the brain the seizure is occurring, but what are those sort of clinical, known, common and not so common, um, short-term impacts of a seizure? Great question. So when I think about the short-term impacts of the seizure, it it really depends on a few things. As you said, location matters. Also, what kind of seizure it is. You know, is it a seizure where someone's having a convulsion, whole body convulsion, and it's going on for a long time or not? So how long the seizure lasts also matters when we think about sort of the short-term, you know, damage that might be caused. So we know that when people have long convulsive seizures, Those are the seizures that put them at most risk for um, having, you know, brain damage. And when I when I say brain damage, we're talking about, you know, injury to or loss of, you know, death of brain cells, essentially. Um, And so typically I think of those as 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 happening in 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 these prolonged seizures that last for, you know, tens of minutes to, to hours, things like that. But seizures that last much for a much shorter time, you know, seconds, a minute may not be associated with you know, clear physical, physical damage that we can see, at least. That's how I think about the short-term impacts of, of, in terms of physical damage. Now, there's also cognitive effects of seizures as well when a seizure is going on, of course. And seizures can affect you know, normal cognitive processes. Almost think of it like, um, think of it like you know, a thunderstorm that's gonna affect your cell phone reception, right? It's kind of like that. It can kind of scramble the signals of the brain that would normally be helping you think and remember things. So during a seizure, someone, you know, as part of the symptoms of the seizure, people may not be aware of the world around them, right? So it can look like they're awake, their eyes might be open, but, you know, you could, you know, call their name, you could wave your hand in front of their face, they would be totally unaware of what's going on around them. And so, if they're unaware of what's going on, basically nothing around the world is getting into their brains, they're not gonna be able to remember that afterwards, right? So people will often you know, say like, uh, my memory is really affected you know, during the seizure because I don't remember anything around the seizure. It's kind of a subtle distinction, I'll say. It's not so much a memory issue at that point, it's more of how much you were actually aware of during that point. Does that make sense? 
that makes total sense. I love your analogy to, you know, the scrambled cell reception, you know, you're, you're just, you're not even able, your brain's not able to receive additional input at that time, which is why you can have that sort of buffer of memory loss, certainly during, but the immediate before and after as well. That, I mean, that makes so much sense to me. I want to focus specifically for a moment on children, on pediatric patients. Clearly, a child's brain is still growing. It is still developing. And I think that's one of the reasons that, um, I mean, epilep epilepsy is scary regardless, but when you're talking about a developing brain, um, it adds an extra layer of uh, uncertainty and, and fear to the mix. You talk about the different seizure types. You talk about the different places in the brain where they're occurring, but there's also the impact of seizures occurring over and over and over again and sort of the compounded effect of that. And so I wonder what traditionally is that long-term effect of seizures over the course of time in a developing child's brain? You know, everybody's different. Every child is different, right? And the reasons that a child may develop epilepsy can, can vary wildly, right? In terms of, you know, maybe they had an injury, a brain injury at, at birth or, um, you know, a, a, a malformation of the brain that they were born with that, that causes their epilepsy. Or maybe they have a certain type of disease or condition that's a progressive condition that also causes epilepsy as part of it, right? So, you know, each of these cases is a bit unique in terms of, hey, what the kind of expected trajectory is, you know, is there a single injury that, that sort of the child is, is, um, is going to be living with, you know, that may also be causing seizures over time, or is there a progressive um, disease, right, that has its own kind of implications in terms of what might be expected in the future, right? So, so all those things differ. If I can generalize, I'll try to generalize here. Um, so seizures can definitely affect brain development, right? And for many different reasons. And so you can think about, um, well, let me just talk about some studies that people have done looking at this, right? So people have looked at kids who have a certain kind of epilepsy called temporal lobe epilepsy, right? And they've looked at, you know, kind of tests of learning and memory over time and how learning and memory performance develops over time, essentially. And, you know, they can compare that to kids who don't have epilepsy, right? So we know that, you know, as the brain normally develops, your learning and memory performance, you know, gets better and better over time and, and it peaks at a certain point, right? And in kids who have temporal lobe epilepsy, what we know is that their sort of their rate of developing these learning and memory skills is slower than in kids who don't have epilepsy, right? And not only is the rate slower, but these kids with epilepsy may not hit sort of the peak level of memory and learning performance that a child without epilepsy might achieve, right? So, um, so there are these developmental aspects, but what I'll say is it can be really hard to disentangle seizures, the effects of seizures on these kinds of developmental aspects from other brain abnormalities that are associated with seizures, right? So you can imagine, why do these kids have temporal lobe epilepsy? Was there something in their brain, something that related to the connectivity, the way their brain cells were connected, or was there you know, some sort of anatomical abnormality or a structural abnormality in the brain that led to them having temporal lobe epilepsy. And so maybe it's not the seizures themselves that are causing this problem, you know, this, this change in development, but maybe it's, you know, this underlying brain abnormality that makes it so that they aren't able to, to learn as, as quickly or, or, or reach that same level of performance as someone who doesn't have epilepsy. So these things can be, you know, in, in, in real life, they can be really difficult to disentangle sometimes. That's an excellent point. Epilepsy has so many comorbidities that you are working through. It's hard to figure out what is exclusively um, the cause of seizures versus something else. Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. 
Did you know that 30% of those diagnosed with epilepsy do not respond to current medications? That is why, for over 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has been dedicated to funding patient-focused research to find a cure for epilepsy. Learn more about our mission and our research by visiting cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. So I, I sort of wonder, is there, are you able to find more clarity in that conundrum with adults? Uh, what do you see in adults where you're, there is a developed brain where, you know, it's, it's easier to compare. You can look at an MRI from now and five years later, and there's going to be more consistency as opposed to with a growing and developing brain. What can you see about the impacts of seizures in an adult in terms of um, cognition and memory? Yeah. So in adults, it's obviously, as you said, different um, because the brain has largely developed. And now we're talking about, you know, you've reached a certain level of function and we're thinking about, you know, is this function going to decline over time due to continued seizures, right? So what I'll say there is that, again, it still depends. Everyone's a little different again. And, and even in adults, there's an underlying cause for many people to be having seizures as, as adults, right? Um, so, you know, we have to take things like that into account too. You know, I do often counsel my patients in terms of thinking about long-term effects of uncontrolled seizures, that these can be associated with longer-term kind of decline in cognition and in memory. I think a good example of that is, you know, we take care of a lot of patients who have what we call medication refractory epilepsy. You know, they have continued seizures despite medications. And, and many of them often think about undergoing epilepsy surgery, right, as a way to treat their, as a way to treat their seizures. So, you know, one of the things that we'll often do in these patients is what we call neuropsychological testing, right? It's a very extensive set of tests that test, you know, all sorts of domains of cognition from memory to language to, you know, how well you're able to plan and organize things. But what we see in these patients, you know, and, and I'll use temporal lobe epilepsy again as an example here, just because it's a very common kind of epilepsy, so we have more data on it. Um, in people who have temporal lobe epilepsy, we can definitely see impairments in memory over time, especially in people who have, you know, again, refractory seizures. And what's interesting there is that the kinds of impairments in memory actually depend on even what side of the brain the temporal lobe epilepsy is on, right? So we know that in most people, um, you know, most people are right-handed and the left side of their brain, the left hemisphere of the brain is what we call the dominant hemisphere. Yeah, it's, it's confusing because, you know, the brain, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. So it's a little switch from that standpoint. But most people are, are what we call left brain dominant. And um, in that case, what that means is that most of their language and memory function is localized to that left side of their brain. So in people who have left sided temporal lobe epilepsy, we can often see more severe learning and memory deficits in, in those patients than if you say had right sided temporal lobe epilepsy, um, where those, those um, impairments may not be quite as, as severe. So, um, so yes, over time, I think that continued seizures can definitely cause, you know, worsening in cognition. Again, that I don't want to give the message that, you know, everyone who has seizures over time is going to have worse cogn cognition. That's certainly not the case. But we, but it's, but it is something that we can see um, in 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 people who have had, you know, long um, a long history of of uncontrolled seizures. I mean, if someone is having an electrical storm in their brain, it's hard to imagine that there isn't you know, a little bit of scrambling going on over time, right? I, I just, and to different degrees, certainly. And, you know, and there's, there's aging that is going to impact that. Also, at some point, we just begin to become a little less sharp. I guess, to that end, Dr. Lamb, I wonder, is there a way that we can determine, you know, in, in someone who is aging, who has had epilepsy for years, are they going to be able to tell, you know, when they're, they sense that their cognition is dulling? Is there a way that they can tell whether that's as a result of seizures or if it's a result of just general aging? 
Yeah, that is a fantastic question. I have a lot of a lot of my older adult patients will will wonder that. And what I'll say is that you know we know that there are normal processes that happen as people age, right? There's just normal changes where people do lose some brain cells over time. You know, we lose some of the connections between our brain cells over time, right? And so these kinds of brain structure changes will affect, you know, thinking as we get older. But generally, you know, normal aging shouldn't affect your function, your daily function that much, right? You might notice things like, you know, I'm a little slower at, at doing this than I used to be. Maybe it takes me a little longer to put together a complicated recipe in the kitchen than it used to, right? Um, I'm not as good as multitasking as I used to be, things like that, um, where there are these like subtle things that people will notice over time. But in general, we wouldn't expect it to be something like that that's so severe that like all of a sudden, you know, I am not able to pay my bills or, I, you know, have trouble navigating and I really can't drive anymore. Those are not normal changes in aging, right? And so, you know, how do you differentiate that from, you know, epilepsy changes? Again, it can be complicated, but I think what can be helpful is, you know, I mentioned neuropsychological evaluation earlier on. And sometimes, you know, in an older adult patient who's had epilepsy for a while, even if they're, you know, maybe not necessarily saying, I have definitely had, you know, noticing, you know, change in my memory or change in my thinking. I might even suggest that we, you know, get what we call a baseline neuropsychological evaluation, right? Just to get a snapshot in time. You know, here you are. This is your kind of your normal function, right? Where, where, you know, where are you? And that kind of gives you a bar in the future, right? If maybe ten years down the line. You start to say, oh, you know, I feel like something's not quite right or something's changing. What's going on? You can then, you know, repeat that neuropsychological evaluation and you have a sense of, you know, where you were 10 years ago. And if you see a significant decline, then, you know, that's not something that we would necessarily expect over time. So, again, there's different reasons for why that decline might happen, of course. But, you know, again, especially when we're talking about subtle changes that can take years you know, that can span years, right, to develop. Um, sometimes having some of these little baseline markers over time can just be helpful in, in teasing out, um, teasing out where what's going on and, and what the causes might be. Is that something, so, so a couple questions here, is that something that should, you would recommend for children and adults? Uh, and then also, when do you recommend that you do that? Is that something that should be done immediately at uh, when that diagnosis is received? Or is that something that you recommend having done later on down the road? Yeah, so again, it depends on the individual. Um, I think in kids, and again, disclosure, I don't actually <laughs> see kids in my clinic. But but obviously, it's an area, you know, it's a time, as we talked about earlier, of rapid development, you know, brain development. Um, and so in a child who has active epilepsy and there's concerns about whether they're developing appropriately and things like that, I think that getting neuropsychological evaluations in kids certainly makes sense. And again, to assess sort of shorter and longer term impacts of, of seizures and medications and things like that. And also to help with, you know, guiding what kinds of resources and supports um, the child could benefit from, right, in terms of school and these IEPs that we talked about. So certainly having that evaluation can um, can provide a lot of information um, to to make sure um, children have the right supports and resources that they need to to continue to develop to their full potential. In adults, it's a little again, it's a little different because the brain's developed and, and you know, we have to think about what we might expect. And, you know, so I think about things like what the underlying um, cause of seizures is in adults, right? So would I necessarily get neuropsychological testing on someone who's just been diagnosed with epilepsy? I don't typically, um, unless they, unless um, the patient is noting, you know, real concerns about their thinking um, or their memory, um, then we might, we might talk about that. I tend to do it in patients, you know, if there's someone who's definitely noticing, you know, who had been fine and, and starting to notice or starting to worry about their their memory um 
then it might be something where um, where I refer them just to get a sense of what's going on, um, you know, how serious the problem is, um, and what things might be leading to that problem. What, what what are all the things that can contribute to that to that issue, um, and that can be helpful in terms of figuring out how to treat those things, right, and and to help them get better from that standpoint. And then I'll often do, you know, as people get older, um, either people who develop seizures later in life as older adults, or people who develop seizures early in life and, and are growing older and, and now are older adults. Um, I do think it's important to, to, um, to assess those patients, especially as we know that, again, people can have cognitive decline around those ages that are, you know, A, possibly due to seizures, but also due to other things that, you know, we worry about as we get older, things like Alzheimer's disease or, or other neurodegenerative condi conditions like that. So um, I will often do an assessment in, in older adults, um, definitely if they're noticing memory issues, but sometimes just as a baseline, even even if they feel like things are going well, just to have that just to have that baseline uh, for comparison. So if it can be determined that cognitive or memory loss is the result of seizures. Is there anything that can be done? Can that damage be repaired or new pathways be trained? It, it, it kind of depends. Is the damage already done, right? And, and when I say that, I mean, is it related to you know loss of brain cells over time and you're, you're not gonna get those brain cells back? Or is the damage ongoing? Meaning, you know, are you continuing to have seizures frequently? And you know there might be something there you could do to stop, try to stop those seizures, right? And you know we talked about people who have medication refractory seizures or epilepsy, and how we might think about surgical um, treatments to try to get their seizures under better control. And sometimes what we can see is that you know if we can if we can treat someone with an epilepsy surgery, and if that can significantly reduce the frequency of seizures they have sometimes we actually do see that their memory improves um, after the surgery over time. So, you know, not everything is irreversible. Not everything is reversible. Um, but again, I think doing what we can to treat seizures, um, you know, I think can, ha can definitely change the trajectory of things. Are there therapies or other um recommendations that you make to patients who are concerned about cognitive or memory decline yeah definitely um so there's there's many things to consider when when someone comes to me and says you know my my memory is just not as good as it was so obviously seizures are are something that's going to be on the top of everybody's mind are there are are they continuing to have seizures that that can be affecting cognition but you know think about a lot of other things like medication side effects, um, both short and long-term medication side effects. Um, think about things like sleep. Um, sleep is very important for cognition. And you know, if you're not sleeping well for different reasons, maybe again, it could be related to epilepsy or not related to epilepsy, that can also have important effects on your, your thinking from day to day. And then mood is another one that can have effects from day to day. So someone who has, you know, profound depression or anxiety, and we know that, you know, people with epilepsy are more likely to have depression and anxiety than, than the general public. Um, those can certainly affect um, your thinking as well. Um, and sometimes, you know, people say, really, your mood can affect your thinking. But, you know, I have some patients who come in thinking they have Alzheimer's disease, and, and actually it's not Alzheimer's disease, it's depression, really refractory depression. These are all things that you can work on and, and try to optimize to improve cognitive function um, you, as a whole, right? So there's many roads to take. If we want to just focus on, on the cognitive part, what are the things you can do? You know, people say, should I play, you know, should I do Sudoku? Should I do, you know, all sorts of like crossword puzzles and things like that. Um, so I, I had mentioned earlier, you know, cognitive therapy is something that that I'll often refer people to. And, you know, so what is that? Think about it kind of like physical therapy, right? So if you, let's say, injured your back, you threw out your back or something like that, right? Your, your doctor might refer you to have physical therapy. And the idea there would be to, A, kind of help you recover, right? But also be strengthen the different muscles you need, the core muscles, 
so that you don't injure your back again, or at least so that you can manage and, and, and get what you need to do done, right, despite, despite this back pain. So cognitive therapy is sort of like that from the standpoint of, let's say you have some cognitive impairments that are related to, to seizures. You know, it may not, it may be a very um, specific kind of cognitive impairment, right? Maybe it's just, just memory, right? So there are things that you could do that can help compensate for those memory problems, right? Um, so writing lists, having calendars, checklists, things like that, right? And so cognitive therapists um, can be very helpful in terms of, you know, assessing where the problem is and then helping you um, come up with strategies or, you know, even exercises to kind of strengthen other areas that, that can be strengthened to help you function better overall, right? Um, so that's cognitive therapy. Now, there are other programs that are available um, so one of them is called Hobscotch. Yes, we did an episode, uh, recently on the Hobscotch program. Uh, refresh our memories about that one. I was going to say, I was just going to refer people to that, to that episode. So basically this is a program. My, my understanding of it is that it's, it's like a self-management program. Um, it's run out of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, but they, they have this kind of remote thing where they can, where they can, um, you know, help people. Um, but the idea is that there are these like personalized sessions that you have with uh, like a cognitive coach, basically, um, that kind of helps you and, and it's focused on, you know, cognitive impairments and how you can deal with those impairments um, and, and, um, and still kind of have improve your quality of life, essentially. Um, so they've actually done like studies, they publish studies um, looking at how effective this, this program is and and have shown that it, it can improve quality of life in people who do have have cognitive impairments um, related to, to epilepsy that's a great program and you know hopefully it can be expanded or there can be other programs like it in the future that can be resources for people now that's mainly for you know adults and and, and possibly adolescents um you know thinking about resources for kids and again i'm not a pediatric um specialist but with kids it's you know, if if parents are concerned about cognitive issues, memory problems, or thinking problems in their kids, or and whether they're developing appropriately or not, this is something that you should absolutely talk with your pediatrician, with your neurologist about. And and also, um, it's really important to involve your school, your child's school, early on, um, because you know you can work with the teachers at the school to develop what's called an IEP right um individualized education plan i believe um where essentially you know you can can work with them to set you know goals in terms of learning for your child and 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 to make sure that your child has the right resources and supports in place to be able to learn effectively at school right absolutely i think that those are all incredible programs and great advice now i want to go back a little bit earlier to something that you said regarding epilepsy surgery. And I, I know that epilepsy surgery is becoming much more mainstream in large part because it can be done significantly less invasively than it was even, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, but I think it's still kind of scary for some people, right? That, it's you know, definitely scary. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a brain surgery. Brain surgery, yeah. right? So, yeah. you know, the idea is that, you know, hopefully, you know, to prevent this co these cognition and memory issues, you know, you want to stop the seizures, which are potentially making this worse. So you do the seizure or so you do the surgery. But can the surgery have its own cognitive and memory side effects? Or are those rare? Or are, are you exchanging one set of issues for another or not <laughs> yeah it's 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 complicated and it's scary for sure um for a lot of patients and i have a lot of patients where you know i bring up the idea and many of them are like nope don't touch my brain right and you know everyone has kind of a different um approach to it and different you know just feeling about it what i'll say is it's a very individualized thing epilepsy surgery you know it, you really can't talk in generalities because it's it's highly individualized. It depends on, you know, what kind of um, seizures you have, you know, where they come from in the brain, um, and again, where they're located, because that really um, has a big impact in terms of 
the effect a surgery might might have, right? So these are things that I would definitely, if, if you're thinking about them or worried about them, definitely bring these up with your epileptologist, with a neurosurgeon, you know, that you're working with, um, because it's important for them to know what's important to you, right? Some people say, I do not want to have an epilepsy surgery if it's going, if there's any chance it's going to affect my ability to remember things or interact with the world, you know, we don't want to lose that, you know, and as your physicians, you know, I certainly would never want to wish that upon one of my patients, right? So there's a lot of testing and evaluations that we do in, in, in working someone up um, to see what kind of surgery they might be, they might, um, what kind of surgery might help them um, without hurting them, right? And so what you know, your expectations are, or what your 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 hopes are um, from a surgery outcome is is really important. It's a really important discussion to have with your neurologist and your um, and your neurosurgeon um, to understand those changes. I think the most common treatment for seizures, um, the first treatment for seizures, is medications, and they can have drastic side effects. Um, and I wonder, you know, you sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but what are the short-term effects for some of these medications? And also what are some, you know, do some of these have long-term side effects that patients need to be aware of, you know, generally, but, you know, certainly in terms of, of cognition and memory? Yeah, that's another complicated question. So medications can definitely affect cognition. A lot of patients of mine will say like, yeah, that medicine caused me to be really loopy or really spacey, or I couldn't like have a conversation on that medicine. Those are short term side effects, meaning if you were to stop taking that medication, I would expect those symptoms to go away to clear up basically as the medication comes out of your system. Um, and so those, you know, there are some medicines that tend to, um, to cause those kinds of problems more than other medications. Um, but what I'll say is that it also can vary a lot from person to person. So, you know, do I have some patients who are like, you know, wow, I'm on a huge dose of this medication. I can't even tell it's in my system. Right. And then other patients who are on the exact same medicine at like a tiny dose and they're like, my brain is foggy and I can't think. So, you know, again, there's no, there's not a no, uh, one size fits all, unfortunately. But if you think that, you know, if you've started a new medicine and since starting the medicine, you're like, something's not right with my thinking or I'm feeling cloudy. That's definitely something you should talk with your, your doctor about, right? There are some medicines that can cause longer term effects in terms of, um, you know, sort of um, worsening thinking down the line or over, over like, you know, what we think about is like decades of time being on this, on these medications. These tend to be um, a lot of the older generation medications that we think about. Um, they're used a lot less commonly now. Um, and now there's a lot, you know, there are more medications that I'll say are thought to have more benign or, you know, sort of um, not as harmful long-term side effects. Um, so those tend to be used a lot more, more now than the older medications. Dr. Lamb, this has been so informative and, you know, as it typically is with epilepsy, you know, it, you know, it is so individualized any recommendations or the ideas of how um, seizures and epilepsy are going to affect the brain short term or long term. But I think that this conversation gives our listeners a good general idea, the questions that they should be asking their epileptologist, things they should be looking out for, and you know perhaps how they can differentiate between you know, cognitive decline that is the result of seizures or medications or, uh, or aging or, you know, and how to balance all of that in their head and what the importance is of any of those aspects. So I thank you so much for your time, for your expertise and your insight uh, and for the research and commitment that you have to our epilepsy community. Thanks, Kelly. This was really fun. Thank you, Dr. Lamb, for explaining the potential impacts of epilepsy on cognitive functioning and memory. And thank you for the research that your lab continues to do in this area. As Dr. Lamb made clear, both seizures and the medications prescribed for people with epilepsy can impact cognition and memory. 
That's why Cure Epilepsy is dedicated to funding research to find a cure for epilepsy. To date, Cure has raised more than $90 million to find a cure, funding over 280 grants in 17 countries worldwide. We hope you will help us continue to fund the research that will lead us to a cure by visiting cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Through research, there is hope. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual's specific health situation.